Do you have Miyagi derangement syndrome? Or do you know someone who does? Can you spot the seven warning signs? Is there a cure? I don't watch much television. I think TV does to your brain what sugar does to your teeth. But every once in a while, there's an exception. Something so remarkable in concept and execution that it grabs me in spite of myself. That's the case with Cobra Kai. It's a rare case of a sequel that's even better than the original. I doubt there's anyone in the martial arts community who doesn't know the movie, The Karate Kid. It came out in 1984. Now, I started studying martial arts beginning with karate in around 1964. So by the time Daniel LaRusso and Johnny Lawrence had their showdown on the mat, I'd already heard enough sensei stories to make a dozen movies. Mr. Miyagi, the character who will be Daniel's karate mentor, was written by Robert Mark Kamen and brought to life by Pat Morita. Now, Mr. Miyagi was a kind of composite of all the karate teachers who ever smiled inscrutably at their eager young minions. His sayings and teachings and exploits were very familiar to me. I'd heard a lot of them before. He was the embodiment of generations of dojo lore. Now, Cobra Kai picks up the story of Daniel and Johnny about 30 years after their fateful match. They're a lot older now, but they might as well be training in Peter Pan's dojo because they still haven't grown up. What I find fascinating, Captain, is that as different as these two characters are, superficially at least, they both make exactly the same mistake. I recognize that mistake because I made it once myself. Maybe I can help you avoid making it. Uh, maybe not. In honor of Pat Morita, and all the real-life Mr. Miyagi's who ever tried to get a lick of sense past a human skull, we're going to call this mistake the Miyagi Derangement Syndrome. Look, there's nothing wrong with respecting your sensei, your, your fencing master, your teacher. You should respect them. A good teacher can be like a life jacket when you're tossed upon cloudy seas. But like any other strength, respect taken to an extreme, can become a weakness. When respect crosses the line, you're in a completely different state and your idea is no good there. Just where is that line? I would submit that it's the line between respect and worship. It's where you start being driven by emotion instead of being ruled by reason. It's where your teacher stops being a life jacket, starts being an anchor. People who have Miyagi derangement syndrome exhibit the following seven symptoms. Number one, they believe that their teacher's way is the right way, the only right way, and all other ways are fundamentally flawed. Number two, they find deep and profound meaning in their teacher's every cough, sneeze, and fart, except their teacher doesn't cough, sneeze, or fart. Number three, they believe their teacher to be an enlightened human being, perfect and infallible. He's the supreme authority on everything. His knowledge is vast, while others' knowledge is only half vast. Number four, they consider any questioning of their sensei's teachings to be an act of supreme disloyalty. Number five, they regard their fellow followers of their teacher as good, pure, intelligent, and moral, and all others as evil, tainted, stupid, and corrupt, or at the very best, misguided. Number six, they summarily dismiss any and all evidence contrary to these beliefs, because any contradiction must be by definition Biased, cherry-picking, inaccurate, irrelevant, out of context, or fake news. Yeah. Any stigma to beat a dogma. Number seven. They don't just want to follow their teacher. They want to be him. They quite often imitate the master, 
the way he stands, the way he walks, the way he speaks. Here's a quick side story. I knew this here guy, see, he talked like this here. I think he might have been from Jersey. But when he counted in, in the dojo, you know, he sounded like Ich ni san chi go rok shi Fascinating captain. Actually, your Miyagi doesn't even have to be a person. You can Miyagify most anything, and, and people have. In one common variation of MDS, the Miyagi isn't a human being, but a book, a sacred book. Human beings age and grow. They learn, reflect, and sometimes change their opinions. But a book? A book is the perfect Miyagi, as long as the author has been dead a good long while and is unavailable for questions. The book cannot be cross-examined. It's fixed and final. There's no danger that the book will grow, learn, reflect, or change. It's permanente. Might as well be carved in stone by the finger of God, and the Miyagi worshiper treats it as if it were. They will memorize it, quote it, chapter and verse, like the Bible, or the Quran, or the underlined parts of a novel by Henry Miller. They will affect a style of dress they imagine to be reflective of the authors. They will contort their bodies into postures that are imperfect portrayals of imperfect illustrations. They will argue about the true meaning of words and languages they don't speak. They'll debate the brightness of the sun while standing in the dark with their eyes closed. Miyagi derangement syndrome can be a recurring malaise like herpes or malaria or the blues or voting. If the afflicted is cut off from his Miyagi, he's like a drowning man desperately splashing around for something else to keep him afloat, another Miyagi. The MDS victim will transfer his delusion to his new teacher. Since MDS is a zero-sum psychosis, the afflicted must repudiate his old teacher as part of the process of deifying his new teacher. The god of the old religion becomes the devil of the new religion. The MDS victim replaces old, false, true teachings with new, true, true teachings. This replacement can happen more than once. What causes Miyagi derangement syndrome? Why do so many people Miyagify their teacher? Well, it's complicated. The world can be a dark and dangerous place. It's filled with contradictions, conflicts, and chaos. Fear, pain, injustice. We're set adrift on this tempest without compass or sextant to grapple with a question for which there may be no answer, at least no answer that we can wrap our puny human minds around. We're beset by doubt and fear fills in the spaces between our doubts. Wouldn't it be wonderful if there was something that assuaged all our fears, answered all our questions, something that replaced all our doubt with certainty? One simple answer to all the complex questions. Wouldn't it be great to have a star to steer by? We need something. We need it so bad that if we can't find something that fits, hell will find something else and make it fit. At one time or another, I think we all go looking for love in all the wrong places. We create a Miyagi, and we never again have to answer any impossible questions or question any impossible answers. Don't worry, be happy. So you were pretty sure that you were on the one true path to enlightenment, but now you're wondering if maybe you got in the wrong lane, missed your exit, and now you're stuck on the expressway to hell. Well, if you're wondering, there may be hope for you to dodge the bullet. 
Because if you had full-blown MDS, you wouldn't even be asking that question. If you haven't completely succumbed, I only know of one thing that works. No matter how far you go down the wrong road, turn around. Hop on the bus, Gus. Make a new plan, Stan. Like, split the scene, Daddy-o. Because one thing for sure, if you want to get clean and sober, you can't go and hang out with the same old gang you used to get high with. Now, if the thought of cutting loose from your Miyagi makes your palms sweaty and your, your stomach churn, you better do it RFN. Miyagification is driven by emotion, not guided by reason. That's why you can't fix it with an intervention, no matter how much data or evidence or conclusive proof you may present. You can't reason a person out of a position that they didn't reason themselves into. Once afflicted, those infected with MDS only rarely recover, and almost never by your persuasion or by their own volition because they refuse to consider the possibility that they may have it. It's like a guy who's falling down drunk, insisting that he's okay to drive, <laughs> and their impaired judgment prevents them from realizing that their judgment is impaired. And the more impaired he is, the more he thinks he's not. The only cure is spontaneous remission that rides into town on the back of a lightning bolt. See, you don't, you don't decide to leave Plato's cave because you're smarter than the other prisoners. Someone or something forces you out of the cave with you kicking and screaming and trying to claw your way back in, back to that shadowy darkness you know and love. And the sunlight sears your dearest, most sincerely held beliefs as if they were a bunch of squeaky little vampires. Truth is excruciating long before it's elucidating. But the sun proves stronger than your resistance. And after a while, the cave no longer holds any attraction for you. So you got a lucky break, as long as you never have to go back in. As with so many things, an ounce of prevention is worth a metric fuck ton of cure as part of the fiduciary relationship I have with my students, it's my responsibility to do everything I can to make sure my students don't miagify me. And if I do it right, they won't miagify anybody else either. The first tool I use is what I call Crown's Law, not to be confused with Cole's Law, which is shredded cabbage and mayonnaise. Crown's Law says this, never let anybody else do your thinking for you. And that includes me. No matter what the question might be, the one answer that will always be wrong is because the master said so. I don't just teach you what to do and how to do it. I teach you why we do it that way. Everything we do has a reason. I want you to know that reason. I want you to know it for an absolute fact. And I'll set things up so you can experience it, feel it, know the truth of it for yourself, beyond any doubt. You'll know it's true because you experience the truth of it, not just because I say it's true. In practice, it goes something like this. I set up a situation and I ask my student, what do you think he should do, A or B? He correctly says A. And I say, are you sure? See, it's not enough to be right. You have to know that you're right. If he says yes, I say, what makes you so sure? I have him explain it. And I check his thinking to make sure he is thinking and not just parroting. See, I don't want him to choose A because he thinks I want him to choose A. I don't want him to do it to please me. I want him to choose A only if he's sure that it's the right thing to do. And if he's not sure, I want him to say, I'm not sure. And then I say, what is it you're not sure about? And we go over it, step by step, inch by inch, until he is sure. You have to know the why that determines the how of your what. 
It has to belong to you. You can't be borrowing it from me. So I badger my students a lot. I call them on things. I question what they know and how they know it. I want them to be able to explain it to me with unshakable certainty because I will try to shake it. That's the first level. It's all very cognitive. But there's a higher level. Now this is only for advanced students. You, you can't do this with somebody who doesn't know anything yet. I do this when you know some things about technique, tactics, strategy. This is when I know that you know the why behind the how of the what. And then I test you. I'll set up a situation for which the correct response is A. Now you know it's A. You've done it a thousand times. You've explained it a hundred times. There's no doubt in your mind that the right, true, and correct response is A. You know it's A, and I know you know it's A. But I ask you to do B instead. And B doesn't work, because B is the wrong response. Now at that point, at that point, my student has two choices. They can act in accordance with what they know to be true from their own direct experience and knowledge, or they can do what I tell them to do. The correct thing to do is option one. Now, most people need a little help getting there, and that's part of my job, too. They get confused, they get frustrated, they get angry, but we work through it. Sometimes there's some shouting involved. There may be some swearing. <laughs> Sometimes there's even a little crying. Sometimes it takes a while. We take whatever time it takes. But eventually they get it. They tap into the strength and courage and integrity that they have. And finally, well, they basically tell me to go fuck myself. <laughs> and in that moment, I think they're completely bewildered that I seem so happy to hear that. They probably don't expect me to say that I'm proud of them. But once they get it, once they decide to go with the truth that they know and not back down, no matter how I insist, no matter how severely I badger them, then they're starting to develop MDS immunity. After that, I'll occasionally give them a booster. I may give the verbal cue, disengage, but I'll give the physical cue for straight attack. When there's a conflict between what I say and reality, they should go with reality. They should always go with their sense and senses. They should act in accordance with what's really happening and not just mindlessly assume that whatever I say is going to be true and correct. I sometimes call this Marvin's Law. Believe half of what you see and none of what you hear. Put your trust in no one but yourself and don't be too sure about yourself. If you know for a fact that something is true, I mean you know it inside and out from your own direct experience, your own observation, your own reflection and critical analysis, then don't let anything sway you, no matter what the consequences. That's a pretty high bar. To meet it, you're going to have to resist being influenced by the four fallacies of the apocalypse, authority, popularity, novelty, and tradition. Maybe we'll talk more about that sometime. But Mr. Miyagi was not a perfect human being. He had flaws, he made mistakes, he had regrets, he had demons. If he was a great teacher, it wasn't in spite of those things was because of them. But in the end, a teacher only makes suggestions. You make the decisions. Take responsibility for it. And you can be your own Mr. Miyagi. <laughs>